Coral reefs occupy barely 1% of Earth's surface. Yet, they host more than one quarter of marine life and support almost one billion people. Coral reefs provide um, incredibly valuable ecosystem services to the planet. But a changing climate is putting pressure on reef ecosystems. We've lost at least 25% of coral reef surface area across the world within the last four decades alone. And the pace is accelerating. The discovery of robust, healthy super reefs that seem immune to a warming ocean has surprised scientists and may be the key to saving reef systems around the world. What we saw in that lagoon was that the live coral cover had actually increased before and after the heat wave. We didn't record one single coral death the fact that they're disproportionately occupying the oceans in the developing world, I think, provides even more of an impetus for us globally to you know, protect and sustainably use them. Scientists are working together with local communities to save these fragile undersea worlds and even create new ones. The ocean's coral reefs are living planets under the sea. They're vital nurseries for the world's fish stocks and support many endangered species. Up to one billion people around the world are being supported by coral reef ecosystems through the provision of food, arable land. They also provide thousands of kilometers of coastline with protections from waves and storms and even tsunamis. Yet, rising ocean temperatures due to climate change is triggering a catastrophic response from the coral reefs. The coral reefs of today that evolved through the last 10,000 years of relatively stable climate are having to keep pace with an ocean that's rapidly changing. The corals that form the Earth's reefs have a symbiotic relationship with algae living inside them. Both corals and algae depend on this partnership to thrive. Yet, when stressed by high temperatures, corals often expel their algae, turning white. You just see fields and fields of corals of all different sizes and shapes and species all turn white because they've lost their symbionts. A brief bleaching event doesn't necessarily kill coral, but prolonged, severe bleaching can lead to disease and starvation. We're coming out, I think, to a tipping point where, uh, you know, corals are gonna start bleaching so frequently that we're gonna have even more mass mortality than we've seen so far. 2015 sparked an unprecedented three-year-long global ocean heat wave that caused bleaching of more than 75% of Earth's tropical reefs and killed nearly 30% of reef systems. The United States reef system called Jarvis Island used to be the most productive, highest biomass, fish biomass, coral reef in the Pacific. In the 2015 heat wave, we lost 98% of the corals on Jarvis Island. It's completely decimated. What was once fields and fields of gorgeous corals was now just rubble and cyanobacteria. And to this day, that's seven years later, that coral reef ecosystem has not recovered. It was this major heat event that led to the formation of the Super Reefs Alliance. We were funded by the National Science Foundation to go out to various reef systems across the Pacific 
in the wake of the 2015 heat wave to record the devastation, to record and report on the catastrophe that was happening. Their investigation brought about a surprising discovery near the island nation of Kiribati. Just a thousand kilometers to the west of Jarvis, in the Phoenix Islands Marine Protected Area, we were studying a coral reef island called Canton. But the corals in Canton did not respond the same way to that excessive heat as the corals in Jarvis. In fact, what we saw in that lagoon was that the live coral cover had actually increased before and after the heat wave. We didn't record one single coral death in Canton Lagoon during the 2015 heat wave despite the excessive heat. This super reef community not only survived the global heat wave, it was thriving. We're not talking about individual corals or tiny areas of coral. We're talking about substantive tracts of coral reef communities that don't respond the same way to ocean warming as the average coral communities across the global tropics. But what's protecting these reefs and giving them their superpowers? Could they hold the key to surviving warming oceans? Scientists discovered that the corals found better suited to survive extreme heat had commonalities. This includes corals from reefs typically hotter than their neighbors, places where the corals are constantly experiencing large fluctuations in temperature over 24 hours, and where oceanographic processes, such as waves or upwelling, can shield the coral community from the heat like an air conditioner. Once we realized that there were coral reefs that are actually surviving climate change, that became a priority for conservation. What we would do is protect the heat resilient communities and allow the heat resilient communities to produce billions of larvae that then migrate on the ocean currents, settle in the neighboring devastated areas, reseed it, and regrow. The question is, how do you find them? Scientists have created cutting-edge hydrodynamic models of coral reef ecosystems called digital reefs. I think one of the things that we find is that there's this time lag um, in, in collecting data through to getting that data to the people who need it. Um, and that is, time is something that we, we don't have a lot of. Digital Reefs harnesses the power of digital twin technology to transform the way scientists access, interact with, and use data. It's going to get data into the hands of managers more quickly, and it's going to do it in a visually intuitive way that's going to make them understand the data in ways that they haven't been able to, to do so far. If you have the digital reef of your coral reef system on your computer, that living, breathing, changing reef system, Digital Reefs allows you to choose your fish or your coral and over time track where those millions of larvae go. You can see it for yourself in the simulation. And then using that data to come up with designs of marine protected area networks that will function both to preserve the biodiversity of the animals on the reef, but also in terms of management, because some of those fish have to go to areas that, where they can be caught by local stakeholders. Stakeholders can test the impacts of new infrastructure, management techniques, or potential heat events on coral ecosystems while providing critical data on live reefs, monitoring and tracking them through time. Digital reefs is really revolutionary and transformative because there is no single platform out there in existence that provides you with a visual 
representation of an entire coral reef system living and breathing and moving through time that's based on actual data. We want to make sure that you can access these data from your cell phone. If you're a research scientist, you obviously have access to computers. We want to make sure that you can get access to it from those as well. So I think universally accessible is a, is a big mantra that we have. Once you have that tool in place, once you empower people with information and knowledge, then people come on board with the conservation and management and restoration of coral reefs. Globally, coral reefs are under threat to warming oceans, human development, and disease. But scientists are not giving up hope. Ultimately, what we want to do is construct a global network of digital reefs that are interconnected, talking to each other, and universally accessible. The digital twin will be a game changer because it's not only going to function um, in ways that we can imagine now, but I think it's actually going to be so much more once the twin becomes available to, to scientists and stakeholders. We've made a ton of progress in our scientific understanding of coral reef resilience to climate change. And we've started to develop the technologies and the tools to be able to use that information for the conservation and management of coral reef systems. I see the digital twin actually as a template for what could become a much bigger program in terms of the use of digital twins in ocean science and engineering you know, across the globe. That's how we save them. Not by keeping the information and data to ourselves, but empowering people to use that information to improve their lives. <laughs>